Good evening, everyone. It's nice to see so many familiar names here in the audience. My name is Agam Patel, and I'm the Associate Director here at UCR Palm Desert. I want to welcome all of you to the Arts and Letters Lecture Series today. We are so grateful that you're able to join us. And tonight, tonight, you're in for a treat. I want to thank our very own Maggie Dance, who had the brilliant idea about debut authors and conversation about their respective journeys, and then writing about it. But before I turn it over to Jenny O'Connell, our moderator this evening, some important reminders. The next lecture in this very series will be on February 3rd, where we'll be talking to none other than Todd Goldberg about his new short story collection, The Low Desert. Then, on February 4th, in partnership with our friends from UCR's Center for Ideas and Society, we'll be talking about crucial moments that shaped African politics. So please mark your calendars. I would like to acknowledge and thank all of our Palm Desert partners. Your generosity and contributions help support the programming we bring to all of you, which is free and open to the public. So big thank you. I would also like to respectfully acknowledge and recognize our responsibility to the original and current caretakers of this land, water, and air. The Kuia, Tongva, Lucenio, and Serrano peoples, and all of their ancestors and descendants, past, present, and future. Today, this meeting, this meeting place is home to many indigenous people from all over the world, including UCR faculty, students, and staff. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work in these homelands. All right, let's get started, shall we? Our moderator this evening is Jenny O'Connell. Jenny O'Connell's debut book project, Finding Petronella, traces her 2014 solo trek across Finland, following the footsteps of a female legend into the heart of the Arctic Circle. A 2019 Maine Literary Award finalist and Pushcart Prize nominee, Jenny's writing has appeared in or is in forthcoming from Creative Nonfiction, Slice Magazine, Appalachia Journal, Hippocampus, Camus, Stone Coast Review, Decor Maine, Flyaway Journal of Writing and Environment, and the anthology Awake in the World. She lives in Portland, Maine, where she teaches creative writing at the Telling Room, works for Stone Coast MFA on initiatives that power writers to creative positive, to create positive change through literary arts, and guides wilderness expeditions in the Eastern United States and abroad. Take it away, Jenny, welcome. Thank you, Agam. And hello, everyone. Thank you so much for choosing to spend tonight with us. Um, we are so grateful to be here. And in a moment, I am going to let our two authors introduce themselves by way of the journeys that brought them here. Um, but before that, we just wanted to give a huge thanks um, to UC Riverside and to all those behind the scenes who um, worked to bring us here. Thank you for having us. Um, hilariously enough, I ended up in this conversation through a friendship with Catherine Standifer, um, who I met, I launched a Kickstarter campaign for my journey to go to Finland. Um, and Katie donated $10 <laughs> to my Kickstarter campaign in 2013. Um, and then years later, when she launched her own Kickstarter campaign for her research in Africa, um, I sent $10 back. <laughs> and so we, <laughs> We bought each other's friendship. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding, but it was uh, definitely the best $10 I've ever spent. And um, we're really grateful to have met Maggie through her debut book as well um, and to be in this conversation on journeys together. So um, buckle up. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Maggie to um, introduce her book to you all and um, then Katie can do the same before we jump into some questions but um, I'm here to moderate the the chat so please feel free if you have any questions for our authors to 
write those into the chat or um, the Q&A box and we will incorporate them into the conversation. So Maggie, over to you. All right, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, and I know so many of you in the audience are already familiar with my book, so I'm gonna keep it really short. But for those of you who don't, um, I'm the author of Braver Than You Think, Around the World on the Trip of My Mother's Lifetime. And, um, and this is the story of how I quit my job at the local newspaper, The Desert Sun. Um, I sold all of my things and, um, and I left on this journey around the world to complete my mom's bucket list um, because she uh, was suffering from early onset Alzheimer's disease. And she, she was a person who always thought um, there were places she wanted to go or dreams she had, um, goals she wanted to achieve. And she thought there would be time later and there wasn't. And so in her honor, I decided to do that for her. Um, so my book is a travel story through South America, Africa, and Asia. Um, and, and it's a mother-daughter story, but it's also a story about what it means to live a life, um, about what it means to have a life well lived. Um, it's, it's a story about grappling with, you know, um, what happens when a loved one is diagnosed with a disease that's always fatal. Um, it's about reckoning with your own mortality. Uh, so I, it's, it's a real journey. It's a lot of baggage. It's a lot of li literal baggage because I had a 50 pound backpack, um, but it's a lot of emotional baggage that I took around the world with me. Um, and Katie, could you please tell everyone about your beautiful memoir, Lightning Flowers? Sure, thanks Maggie. So I'm the author of Lightning Flowers, my journey to uncover the cost of saving a life. And Lightning Flowers tells the story of my troubled relationship to my own implanted cardiac defibrillator, which is a device that is ideally life-saving, but that in my story is a little bit more complicated than that. So when I began writing it um, years ago, I thought it would be mostly a healthcare and illness story. And then one day in 2012, um, a scene that sits in the prologue of the book right at the beginning, I was playing intramural soccer in Tucson, Arizona and took three shocks to the heart by accident. I didn't know at the time whether or not they were accidental, but they were essentially the device um, thinking I needed shocks when I did not need, need those shocks. So, so I took about 2000 volts to the heart which is a crazy experience. Um, it's pretty horrifying. And in the strange moments afterward, as I was lying on the ground and looking up at the sky, I found myself thinking, if that just saved my life and the metals in my body came from places where, um, where armed groups had taken over a mine, and were using the profits to perpetrate acts of violence in the area. If they were keeping sex slaves or if they were forcing children to work, um, if the metal in my body came from places where ecosystems were really being dismantled or uh, local villagers were not being treated well, what, what did that mean? What did it mean to carry this metal inside me? And so the book is a healthcare story about me passing out in a parking lot at age 24 and having to figure out as an uninsured person how to get access to an implanted cardiac defibrillator. And then it is the story of my walk with that device, but it's also the story of my journey to actually visit mines and factories all over the world, looking at what it actually takes to make an ICD. Um, as the subtitle says, uncovering the real cost of saving a life. What actually does it look like to put metal in the bodies of people here in the West? Um, so yeah, in that journey, uh, the book takes us to a factory in Silmar, California, where my defibrillator was made, as well as a factory in Scottsdale, Arizona. And then some large portions of the book unfold in Madagascar and in South Africa and Rwanda. And there's a few other journeys in there, but really um, the thrust of the walk is trying to understand what it is that's in my body and how to weigh what my life is worth. Thank you both. Um, 
it's striking to me how you came to your stories so differently, but how they both really revolve around living a life and what it means to live a life and what it means to live a good life or a life that you love. Um, and that takes a great deal of courage. And so um, we talked about this a little bit previously, but there is thinking you can do something. There's having the idea for the journey or for this thing that might kind of turn your life on its end. And then there's the actual courage of doing it. There's the actual, um, the actual leaving, the departure. And so I'm curious if either of you have thoughts. Um, I imagine, I know that a lot of us have those similar um, crazy ideas where we're like, we want to do this. We want to take this leap. How did you get yourself out of the door? How did you get the courage to actually embark on your journey? What was that like for you? Um, I'll start with this one and then pass it over to Katie. Uh, so I saw a quote that is so relevant to this. Um, just the other day, I saw it on my tea bag of all places. Um, and it's a Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that says, a hero is no braver than an ordinary man. He's just braver for five minutes longer. And, um, and that's not to say that travelers are heroes or writers are heroes, but I think um, the truth of that statement is that you don't know what you're capable of until you're in it, you know? And, um, and, and it's just um, like pushing yourself so far to the point where you can't turn back. And, um, and in my book, uh, that comes to me early on um, after my mom is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, I, I start skydiving because at that point, um, you know, my thought was, I want to live my life on my own terms. I don't want to grow older and potentially um, get dementia myself. So if I go skydiving, you know, it's a calculated risk, but um, you know, it's a, it's a risk I'm willing to take knowing the alternative. And, um, but the thing is, I was really scared all the time. I was very scared of skydiving. And so I would have to trick myself to get out the door. And then once I was out the door, I was fine. And I really loved the, um, you know, the feeling of free fall. And I enjoyed the act of skydiving, but it was just a matter of like mentally tricking myself out the door. And so I think for me, it's always a process of like knowing where I would turn back and, um, and playing like a trick with myself just to get myself out the door and get myself far enough along to where I can't turn back. It's funny, Maggie, as you're talking about that, one of the parts of your book that I find myself thinking about um, more often is when your partner when you're afraid to go whitewater rafting and your partner is like, no one is forcing you to do this. <laughs> and I think it speaks to the kind of like internal mandate that we have. And I think a lot of my journey is this awareness of, you know, you use the term calculated risk. And I found myself working a lot with risk mitigation, this idea that like everything has risks. And so what are the risks that you can actually like manage and what are the risks that are worth taking right all this all this cost calculating is apparently um the through line in my my work um and so this this sense of like there certainly are risks we could take that we don't have to take and there are risks that we must take and i think that's where the title for this program came from for me you know when i was looking at your book and thinking about my own, just this sense of like internal calling that there's a rightness there. There's like a, uh, the right kind of fear, the kind of fear that's inviting you into the next version of yourself or, so a, a lot of my internal mandate came from the fact that I had just taken 2000 volts to the heart. And I literally in the days afterward did not know how to be a normal living human being. I mean, if you can imagine the feeling of taking electricity from inside your heart, um, the electricity traveled up my arms and actually caused my hands to turn into claws. I, I had this like burned sensation and kind of a soreness from all my muscles clenching at once. 
And so in the days afterward, I was highly aware at every moment that it could happen again, that I could take another shock. And so this sense of like almost having a predator in my body and not knowing how to trust it and not being in control of it. And, you know, when I went to the hospital, not really receiving, um, I went to the hospital just to have the device checked and see why it went off. And, and they really responded in a very blase way as though this were a normal thing to happen and not a big deal. And so I was left trying to figure out like, they're saying it's not a big deal and it is a big deal in my body. It's absolutely a big deal. And how do I live past this moment? And that question that came to me that night on the soccer field, I just couldn't let go of. And so researching at the actual question of like, do I have conflict minerals in my body? What is it that's in me? Does it carry some kind of energetic resonance of the place it came from? And then over time, you know, I would say the other side is I was also in a master of fine arts creative nonfiction program. And so when you're in a writing program and something like this happens to you, there's a little bit more structure to like keep going with it. And the University of Arizona as an MFA is very focused around um, helping people situate their personal story within more universal questions, more global contexts. And uh, I had some very great mentors in research. And so they really like, it began as just an essay, but then it really opened up into like, well, can I figure out if there are conflict minerals in my device? And then when that became impossible, it was like, if I can't pin down whether or not there are conflict minerals in my device, what are all of the different places that the metal could be from that um, is not, it's like, somewhere on the spectrum between the ideal situation and conflict minerals, which are sort of like the worst case scenario. And I just got far enough into it that um, at some point it carried, it carried a life of its own. Like when I didn't get grants for it, then I ended up running the Kickstarter project because I already was moving and already so deep in the question. And so I think there's actually a way in which like, initial failures made me more stubborn. <laughs> like if someone had just offered me a grant in the second month to like go to a mine somewhere on the planet, I don't know if the urgency would have been the same, but that, that sense of like following a question and the question not going away maybe. And I think that's, that's like an underlying feature of these things that we must do also. Like we can ignore them, but I think over a lifetime, each of us sort of learns that sometimes it's easier to just be like, no, that's one of those things I need to do. I think what's so interesting in your story too, is that um, you were like technology averse anyway. And so of course you're already thinking about um, the devices that you have in your life and what role they play and why they're there and like the necessity of it. And so I think you were already curious and had those questions anyway of, of these things. Um, Katie, we have a question from the audience here. Um, what exactly do you mean as conflict minerals? Can you just define that for everyone? Yeah, for sure. So conflict minerals, um, is a term that most recently refers to gold, tin, tantalum, or tungsten mined from the Democratic Republic of Congo or adjoining countries. And the idea of conflict minerals is that in open pit mining, it's possible for armed groups to take control of a mine and then sell what is being mined uh, onto the market at high prices. And so these armed groups fund themselves through mining. The term came originally from, you'll probably recognize the term blood diamonds. And so in the 90s, there were a, a series of diamond fueled wars in Angola and Liberia and Sierra Leone. And then um, in, around 2010, I believe is when well, that's when legislation was getting considered related to conflict minerals in the DRC. So probably folks were using that term for it a bit sooner. Um, but the idea is how do you cut off armed groups from their funding source by not buying the minerals that are coming from those areas? And the reason that armed groups were able to wreak such havoc in the Democratic Republic of Congo is the mostly American appetite for electronics. So tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold are all really, really essential in microelectronic circuitry and um, 
tantalum in particular comes a lot from that part of the world. So yeah, my initial interest was in those minerals. And then I sort of extended my interest out to other minerals that are in my device that are not from that area um, because mining has plenty of other interesting ethical issues to think about as well. But that's probably a good starting working knowledge. Thank you for asking. Um, one thing that is striking to me is just how each of our stories, each of our journeys have kind of forged. I don't think any of us started out the person that we became when we finished the book. Like there was the actual journey itself and then there was the writing of the journey. And I'm fascinated um, for me, I'm in the middle of writing my book right now. And so I'm fascinated with how that process can forge somebody into the person equal to the task of writing it. Um, and I'm curious for the two of you, how those differed? Like, did you have to go back into the journey? For me, it's been this process of there were the things I learned on the journey and I've had to learn them all over again in the writing of it, or just like continue to deepen my awareness of them and my understanding of them. And I'm curious um, how that same courage that it took to start applies to the writing of the book. How did that change? How was it the same for you? Um, yeah, I, I think about that a lot, um, about how if I had written this book immediately when I concluded my trip, it would be such a different book than what actually, you know, I'm holding in my hands right now. Um, and so the writing process of it, um, in some cases, I didn't want to go back to the person I was, you know, I worked hard to become this other version of myself. And, um, and I didn't always make good decisions. And I didn't always like the person I was. And so um, I think, I think the writing itself was almost an act of bravery and going back to some of the most painful moments of my life and some of the poor decisions and trying to figure out like why I did the things that I did. Um, and one of the things in particular that I wrestled with um, in the book and while I was traveling is this question of if I want to become a mother, because knowing that my mom suffered from dementia and her extended illness, which can be really hard on the family and on caregivers. Um, and just considering the fact that did I want to become a mother, um, knowing that my child could potentially deal with that with me someday. Um, but then as I'm writing the book, you know, I, I was writing it as a mom. <laughs> so, um, so it was, um, it was hard for me in some cases to put myself mentally and emotionally back to that space and, um, and to write with the benefit of time and, uh, and distance. Mm. Maggie, we just had a question come in that kind of relates to what you were just saying. Um, in terms of being a mother and having this relationship with your mom. Um, were you, the question is, was your mom aware of this happening to her life as the dementia progressed? And were you able to travel with her at all um, before her disease took the point of no return? Um, I was not able to travel with her. So none of this journey takes place with my mom. Um, when I embarked on this trip, she was already in um, the very advanced stages of the disease. So she no longer knew who I was. Um, she was already living in a facility, in a memory care facility. And, um, and I visited her before I went on the trip. And I tried to communicate with her that I was going on this trip. Um, and, you know, I, I have a million questions about how the brain works and, um, and the awareness of a person with, um, with dementia. Um, and, uh, and I have no idea if she knew what I was trying to communicate at all. Um, I, I made her, you know, I, I let her know that I was going and that I was doing this for her. Um, and, and it's my hope that somehow it, you know, it uh, crossed that bridge and made it into, into her brain somehow, um, but I have no idea. Katie, do you have a thought on um, 
the journey versus the writing of the journey and how um, your courage needs to be aligned throughout or how it changed along the way? Yeah, you know, the journey plays um, plays such a different role in my book. The parts of my book that were hardest to write uh, in an emotional sense were all part of the illness strand. And the strange thing that happened in the way I lived my story is that I was 24, I passed out in a parking lot and learned I had this genetic heart condition. I was uninsured and had to figure out how to get an ICD. And then I did get an ICD and I recovered from that surgery. And then I almost died of sepsis. That's sort of the first half of the book in terms of my health. And it was after that, that I w went to grad school and funded this journey. And so I thought the book was just gonna be the journey to understand where an ICD came from or what it took to make it, plus these early experiences from my twenties. And then as I was trying to write all of that, um, the next chapter of my story happened to me in a really abrupt way. Um, I was on a plane and my, device began vibrating to let me know it had low battery, which meant I had three months to have my next heart surgery. And in that heart surgery, we learned that the wire that connects my device to my heart was broken. And then we did a procedure to try to remove the broken wire and it snapped off. <laughs> and so the second half of the book is really this swerve where I already have been a little bit unsure about the technology, but I do decide to get a second one. And then shortly after deciding to get a second one, the calculus around the trouble the device can cause in my body versus its potential positive impacts just really shifts. So yeah, you know, as Maggie is talking about, the parts of this book that were the most brutal to write were mostly hospital scenes. Um, and they required, they often required me to go away and let all of those things move through my body again, really slowly, like really being with each one. Uh, I, I rented this place. I'm, I live in New Mexico now and I rented a place down the road before I lived in New Mexico two years ago. Um, that's really not very far from where I am now. And uh, just did a lot of middle of the night watching YouTube videos of the procedures that I'd undergone and pausing the video so that I could breathe through them and sometimes screaming. And that stuff is really, really hard. And so there was a way in which to write those former versions of myself um, required integrating them at a bodily level. But that, that really difficult work was very different from the journey that I took um, to Madagascar and Rwanda, which is not to say that there weren't aspects of uh, needing to write a previous self, um, you know, being oneself now and looking back at that other self. But um, something happens in the structure of my book that that made writing the um, I have a braided structure where you're going back and forth. And so the version of me that's doing research in Madagascar has actually been through more than the reader knows she's been through. The reader won't know she's been through all those things till like a couple of chapters later because of the braiding. And so that ended up being um, a... Sorry, am I still on? Yeah. Okay, that was so wild. I think someone tried to call me on FaceTime, which never happens. Sorry, audience. <laughs> this is how you know it's real life because yeah. <laughs> we're all in our living rooms, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, guess, I guess you turn your phone off and FaceTime still goes through your computer, which is crazy. Um, sorry, that was disorienting. So yeah, I um one of the places that I did find myself really needing to rebuild with more awareness than the awareness that I actually had at the moment was in terms of my very complicated responses to being a white American, um, a white American in Madagascar. You know, I didn't, I had spent some time in Africa before I went on this journey, but probably not enough to really know what I was doing and to have my feet under me. And I had never been to a former French colony and um, Madagascar had a very different feel than Sierra Leone was the other country that I had been to twice. Um, and so some of the scenes in my book, 
I really had to work and rework and rework to understand just what form of confusion or discomfort I was having and how to talk about that as a narrator. Because when you are in the midst of certain life experiences, you don't always know what's going on. You know you're having a lot of feelings and I was very distracted with like, how do I get to these places? How do I communicate with my driver who barely speaks English and I don't speak French? My translator's English hasn't turned out to be very good. Oh my gosh, now I'm sick. I of course ate something and had metagastritis. That's my uh, Peace Corps friends jokingly called it. So there just was a lot else going on in terms of like trying to make sure I was doing my research well. And that wasn't what was going to be interesting to readers on the page. So there were some early drafts actually that poor Jenny had to read <laughs> that included like, wow, Katie's now pooping her pants, right? Or Katie's just really stressed out and like talking to all these people on the phone and like, it's not interesting. So for me, um, there, there was sort of a cross section of like, having to write the previous self as a self with a, a more bird's eye view and not wanting to make up things that I wouldn't have been thinking then, but just being able to tease through what was actually there and sort of cut away things that are true, versions of the story that are factual, but that are fundamentally not the story that you're trying to tell. And I think that's like the real um, magic of a journey narrative that's well done is when readers don't necessarily get caught in all the play-by-play -play and like uh, static of what those experiences can be like. And they are able to like get to the heart of something a little bit more clearly or beautifully, um, which is not to say that the page shouldn't include some of the confusion we feel, but I don't know, Does that is that an answer? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um... Your answer actually brings up the idea of, of privilege. And um, I'm curious for you and also for Maggie, um, she wants to answer this as well, just how you navigated your privilege as a white traveler, as an American um, in Africa, both when you were living the journey and when you were writing it, like what, what do you have um, to offer as, you know, something that might be helpful for folks looking to do that or, or how did you do it personally? Yeah, well, I can be um, very honest and say that I did not do it as well as I would like to today. You know, in 2014, I had not begun conscious anti-racism work yet. I began some of that in 2016 um, and really, you know, ramped up probably in the last two years. So there was definitely a way in which my story contained whiteness and privilege at such a deep level that I couldn't even see it. And I was lucky to have very good writers at certain stages of the process who were able to be like, hey, I'm having a question about this. And by asking the question then I was like, oh wow, there's actually a lot there that readers who are different from me may not be just assuming are normal and may need to hear more about, you know, one of the things I end up teasing out in the book early on is my financial relationship with my father. Um, and, and so in terms of the scenes in, on the African continent, you know, if I had six more months to work on my book, if I'd been working on my book between so I turned in my copy edits on July 10th. So the George Floyd protests were occurring while I was doing my copy edits. And there were certain things that I saw that I suddenly was able to see because I had been essentially like working on my eyes <laughs> as a white person that I just hadn't seen before. And I had all white editors and so none of them had noticed and I had all white readers and so none of them had noticed. And I, I wish I'd had more time to rework a couple things, but I at least could make some changes on um, on a more micro level. You know, I caught like something that could have been perceived as a microaggression at the last minute. And, and so to actually be in Madagascar, the French legacy there was really brutal, really brutal. And I really had underestimated how my white skin would be received. And there were villages that I was in where people were really happy to see me because they had been living through something and they felt like no one was listening. And so 
um, they were happy that someone was asking. And I think that was a little closer to the way I expected to be received. You know, um, <laughs> white saviorism runs deep for many of us in this country. And, and, I, and so even though I wouldn't have said like, I'm going there to save someone from something, there was a little bit of that like, oh, I'm gonna bear witness, right? I'm gonna tell someone else's story. And then to get there and be in some of these other villages and understand that it's actually really inappropriate to tell other people's stories, or you have to be very careful how you're treading in that regard. And um, to really understand that I was not welcome in some places, particularly where white folks over and over had come, both writers and researchers uh, and NGO employees, and people had this sense almost of being extracted from, not just by the mining company, but then by all these people that showed up that expected um, answers and stories. And so, yeah, there was a lot of discomfort there. And I think I could have chosen to tell the story in ways that minimized or covered up that discomfort. And one of the things that I really made a decision around was trying to get that uneasiness on the page where I, it fundamentally was a journey of complicity, right? Like the fact of medical, life-saving medical technology in the West creates or literal orders for certain types of minerals and products from other parts of the world. And so even though we are using resources all the time in all types of things, my like potentially life-saving device was complicit in, for instance, a very problematic titanium sands mine that I visited in Southern Madagascar. And so what did it mean to be there and have that in my body and be looking in the eyes, in the faces of these people and to understand that like, there's actually no way that I can tell their story that does justice to it at all or that really carries what it needs to carry. And that um, I needed to get really clear on the fact that I was not necessarily there as a helper. I was there to understand my own co complicity. Um, and I hope that that's what the book ultimately does, even though it's attempting to answer what is a little bit of an unanswerable question. Um, I think in my book, like I, I started this journey with the intention of completing my mom's bucket list. And that sounded just, like a very simple goal. Um, but then as I was traveling, I was also trying to volunteer in places and um, which started out with such great intentions, you know, um, when I was still in California. And then as I was going from place to place, I realized um, that, um, that, you know, volunteering in, in another country is so fraught with, um, with issues and, um, and in a lot of places, I thought, oh, I'm going to go here and do this thing to help people. And, um, and it's not actually what the community needed. And it's not what the community wanted. And for me, um, in my book, it really comes to, it, it really comes to a head when I'm in Rwanda and, and I'm teaching um, some adult students. And, um, and I realize I'm not a teacher. I have no background in education. And so not only am I not helping the women because I don't know how, um, but I could actually be harming them. And, and I'm, not, I'm not leaving this position open for someone who could actually be a good teacher for them. And, um, and so that was a moment when I really recognized um, my, not even uh, my privilege in going into that situation, but also just my complete blindness going into that situation. And, um, and my, the last thing I wanted to do was to go into a place and be um, a white savior. But, um, but I, I do think sometimes good intentions have bad consequences. And, um, and I'm really grateful that I realized that uh, when I was in that situation. And, um, and it was a real step back for me. Um, and so I, w I didn't do as many, um, as many volunteer uh, positions as I continued traveling. And I caution people against um, volunteering in other countries now. 
Thank you both. Um, I want to remind folks who are watching that you are welcome to um, pop some questions into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, so feel free at any point. But one thing that um, I've been thinking about that really relates strongly, it's the through line to both of your journeys. Um, you were both driven there by illness. So for Maggie, it was the illness of your mother um, that you had to learn how to cope with or come to terms with. For Katie, it was personal, like walking straight into the heart of your own illness to interrogate its cost. So um, as two people who chose to walk directly toward illness in some way, I'm curious what that experience has taught you. Um, what has surprised you? What do you have to say about our society's relationship to illness? I'm waiting for you to go, Katie. <laughs> um, but I, I can go ahead and take this one. Um, so one thing that I realized as I was writing this story is that, you know, an illness story um, people have certain expectations of it. And, um, and it's, it's a pretty basic format as far as like the structure of a story um, when you follow an illness. And, um, and, you know, when you tell an Alzheimer's story, it's always going to have an unhappy ending. And I realized that my mom's illness couldn't be the entire through line. And so I would have to find a different structure in order to be able to tell this story. And, and it would move beyond that, um, that narrative. So, um, so I ended up um, making like this narrative structure that um, I call uh, a narrative stegosaurus. So um, like a typical story structure is like a pyramid, you know? And, um, and so with a stegosaurus, like you're still moving to the head, like you're moving toward the top of a pyramid, but I wanted to have like these little, like the, um, the plates on the back of a stegosaurus are like these little points. So I wanted to have like little tiny climaxes of story along the way. Um, so, so that's how I pictured my story and that's how I wanted to, um, to tell it. And then, um, and then what really drove me to write about my mom's illness is that um, I had a really hard time grappling with her dementia. And, um, and people would, you know, recommend books to me and they would always say, oh, have you seen Still Alice or things like that? And the thing is, no, I didn't want to see that I, because I, I knew that story has an unhappy ending. I know that Alzheimer's stories always have an unhappy ending. And I wanted to tell a story that was for someone like me, um, someone who, who had a loved one um, who was battling dementia and, um, and was having trouble themselves dealing with it. And um, a story that would give them some sort of hope at the end and have some sort of lightness in that you know, tunnel of darkness um, because you just don't find that in, in Alzheimer's narratives. So, um, so my intention was to write, a, you know, people always say to write the book that you need. And, um, and I was just trying to write the book that I myself would have wanted to read. You know, what you were saying at the beginning, Maggie, reminded me of this Arthur Frank quote. I quote Arthur Frank a lot in my book. He's a socio-narratologist who studies illness. Um, and I have this quote on my fridge and he says, human illness even when lived as quest, always returns to mourning. And I think about it all the time because my book really wrestled with the difference between what illness is actually like and what is worth reading as a reader. There is something, I don't know how many of you in the audience are writers, but there's something called the imitative fallacy that is basically this idea that we should make readers feel the way something feels in order to get a point across. And of course there are moments that we should make readers feel a particular thing, but this specifically relates to like 
things being boring or things being drawn out or things being repetitive. And Arthur Frank talks about a form of illness narrative called the chaos narrative, which is this it's not even a story, it's not a story, right? It's just a spilling forth in which I think what he says is the troubles go down to impossible depths or something like that. Um, and it's basically this fundamental unstructurability of the material because it is just chaos. And that part of the reason illness can be so horrible is that you are living a life that no longer has a meaningful structure to it. And there were entire periods of my book where the way I experienced my life in those moments was not a story anyone wanted to hear. And as an artist, the my job then became how do I how do I make something that can be of use? And that is a set of craft moves essentially, like not that the rep repetition shouldn't be gestured toward, not that the impenetrability of our medical system shouldn't be written about, but there's a real dance between like how much of that material can be in one place and then how much essaying it needs to be with, how much philosophical inquiry or uh, a different type of narrative piece just like tucked in to, to vary things up for the reader. And in some way I had this double challenge of, trying to live a life that is meaningful in the middle of chaos. And then also as a writer, trying to figure out what that meaning is for other people. And as Maggie gestured toward, you know, I never wanted an implanted cardiac defibrillator. Something in my body said no from the first moment. And I'm, I take that now as a kind of subtle intelligence that we can't, we can't learn to trust ourselves until we've been through things that force us to trust ourselves. And, I think I would have just looked like a crazy person um, as a 24 year old refusing to get a device that could have saved her life at the same time that I was so afraid every day, every minute that I could go into sudden cardiac arrest and, and just die. Um, and so what my through line really ended up being was how in the beginning, I couldn't listen to that voice because I didn't understand that we can't get around death. And the book, what it's marching straight toward, to borrow your language, Jenny, is really, it's marching straight toward the embodied visceral understanding that nothing we do removes death from the equation. And so there's a series of things that happen in the book where first I'm worried I might die and I get an ICD and then I get the ICD, but I almost die of sepsis. And then <laughs> the ICD is quiet for a while, but then it shocks me a bunch randomly and I worry that it could kill me. And then I decide to get a new device and instead I find out I have broken parts in me and we try to take out the broken parts and the broken parts break further. <laughs> and there's, there's a real, um, tumbling toward this final invitation of just accepting. And also, if, if we actually understand that death isn't going anywhere, then what else can we do? And that's the same place that the supply chain portion of my book tumbles toward. There are these sort of unanswerable questions that we can still do some things about. You know, in, in the journey that I have in Madagascar, where I go to two mines, a nickel and cobalt mine in the um, highlands jungle, and then this titanium sands mine that I mentioned, and then I go to South Africa and there's a gold mine, and Rwanda is a um, tin tantalum and tungsten mine uh, kind of snugged up against the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. And those minds all have unintended consequences. And even when companies are trying to um, make decisions that will prevent bad things from happening, the way they set it up ends up having these other, um, these, yeah, tumbling is just the word that keeps coming to, to mind tonight. And so I think ultimately, the through line for me was commanded by this sense of how do you show a kind of dance between what is meaningful about the lives we live and the constant frustrations of 
systems and attempts and just what it means to be human and be in a body that can fail you and and how you learn to walk with that fear. So my book ends in a very strange place. Basically, I have just gotten uh, not great news from a doctor and the book ends a little bit abruptly right there. And the reason for that is that the book is the question of whether or not I would get another device and the book can end once I have my answer once I've really calculated what are what's the life-saving potential and what's the um what's the cost and and do they weigh out and then they don't and so the book can end so that was sort of the um the stitching of the through line but but not easy necessarily to come through to come to and so Jenny I think it gestures back to what you were saying near the beginning about how the story like living the story is one thing and then the act of telling the story sort of tr turns us into someone else, um, delivers the actual insights of the journey that weren't fully available to us at the time that we were there. Yes, thank you. Um, that, that through line of awareness of mortality, as you know, Katie, is really present in, um, in my work too. It's, it's just, something that I feel like changes the way that I prioritize my life and the things that I choose to do. It's this knowledge that I don't get a lot of time here. So like, what am I doing? Am I, am I living the way that I need to be alive? Um, and Maggie, I'd, I'd love to give you a chance to answer that question too, in terms of how mortality shaped um, your journey. There was a question that just came in in the chat um, were you trying to connect with your mother by living what she could not do? Um, and how did that impact your day to day as a tourist? So I, I'm curious if you have any additional insights on how the awareness of either your mother's mortality or just your mortality in general shaped who you were or how you went about your, your journey. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question um, because I realized um, I was so steeped in mourning my mother before she ever died. You know, um, Alzheimer's is is an extended illness, and so um, so it was an extended period of of her dying, and um, and I was so steeped in this grief, and I found myself like it felt like I was just walking this labyrinth that I couldn't get out of, and. Um, and at a certain point, I realized that by doing that, I was doing the same thing my mom had done. You know, I was putting my own things off. And, um, and I wondered what it would mean to actively live. And, and if my mom could do it all over again, what would she do? And, um, and so that's what I decided to do. And so my, my intention in taking this journey was twofold. And it was to connect with her and to honor her by going to the places that she could no longer go to and to do the things that she couldn't do herself. Um, but it was also to um, kind of fulfill a promise to myself and to, um, to actively live um, and to, to do the things that I wanted to do. And so the trip was shaped by my mom. And I see there was another, um, there was another question about, um, if my mom and I had talked about the places she wanted to go. And I was really drawing upon memories um, that I had of my mom expressing um, things she wanted to do. Uh, we always bonded over National Geographic magazines. We had a subscription and every month, you know, we would eagerly go through it together and she would talk about the places she, would, she wanted to go someday. Um, and so that's kind of how I shaped my trip. But then along the way, there were things that I did for myself. Um, and, and, and I left it pretty open-ended too. Um, when I planned the trip, I only planned my flights from continent to continent. And I gave myself many months in between. And so, um, so I knew I had things to do for my mom while I was traveling um, those continents. And then um, I would also, you know, along the way, allow for some spontaneity and for um, for me to indulge uh, some of what I wanted to do. Thank you. Um, we have time for probably about one final question. Um, and I see one that just came in from our listeners. Um, 
Maggie and Katie, did you both take these journeys knowing these experiences would become a book or did the idea of a book come later? I did know that mine was a book when I was working on it. Um, you know, I, I understood while I was living the events in 2009, when I was 24, that that would probably be a book. And I think I thought it would just be an illness narrative. And then when I got to my Master of Fine Arts program and took the shocks to the heart and became obsessed with this question of what it was that was in my body, then I was like, I think it's these two things. And I don't know how they're gonna work together, but I like trust that this, this is the thing. And so I think, I think that's actually like a pretty important point to pause on because so often when we see like finished works, <laughs> it's hard to imagine that people did not know what they were doing, but I did not know what I was doing. You know, I went to my first factory uh, related to the device, maybe three or four weeks after I got shocked. It was like a pretty fast turnaround. I was really obsessed and really motivated. And there happened to be a factory about two hours away that, um, had made my microelectronics. And then from there, I, I ended up getting an exploratory grant from my master's program and spent like a whole summer reading about different mines and mines all over the world and different mining memoirs and different illness memoirs. And I was just trying to like crunch it all together. And all of that was long before I actually flew to the African continent. And then of course, you know, once I was in these places, interviewing people and taking notes and had also done a lot of like more academic research and interviewed experts and um, that act of like, how was it all gonna crunch down? I just had no idea and had no idea for many, many years. <laughs> I didn't, Jenny, um, Jenny actually played a very essential role in the hardest chapter of this book. I had this problem I could not solve in chapter five and my book was so late to the publisher, it was about to get canceled. And she had this like Hail Mary moment of moving some paragraphs into order and all of a sudden like everything made sense, um, but it was really a struggle. So I did know that it was gonna be a book and you would think that that might have set me up better, <laughs> but it still was a a real journey just to um, figure out what to do with the material that seemed potentially bookish. Um, I did not know it was going to be a book. I had no intention of writing about it. Um, in fact, I quit my job at the Desert Sun and I thought, I, I don't want to be a writer anymore. Like I'm so out of love with writing. Maybe I'll find the thing I'm meant to do on this trip. Like maybe I'm meant to work with monkeys and I am not meant to work with monkeys, it turns out. Um, but I, um, I didn't even take any notes or like journal or anything. But um, one great thing about this modern life, or maybe not so great depending on your perspective, but great for me was that um, we leave these robust digital trails. And so I was tweeting and I was posting on Facebook and my sister is a second grade teacher. And every week I would um, write long letters to her class about the people that I met and things I was doing. Um, so all of that like came in handy when, um, when it did come time to write this book. Um, and it wasn't until I was in South Africa when I thought, you know, someday I might want to remember some of this. Um, and so I went into like the South African version of a Hallmark store and I bought um, just a little date book, you know, where um, every page was blank and had a date at the top. And I just made bullet point lists of, um, you know, people I met or, you know, new foods I tried or where I was traveling or just, you know, details about a long bus trip or things like that. And, um, and so I was able to pull from that when I did finally write the book. Um, and then even when I finished the journey and I was in the MFA program at UCR Palm Desert, um, I still didn't know that I was going to write about this. I, I started working on um, a story about a ghost on an airplane <laughs> and <laughs> which sounds so ridiculous now, but but in between working on that story and, um, and some other short stories, I couldn't, I, I, this was the story that I just couldn't shake. And I thought, well, maybe if I write it down, I'll be able to put it aside and work on these other things. And, um, and then, yeah, it, it became um, my main focus after a while. And 
and then a book. It was, it was the story that I really needed to tell. Mm. Well, what a through line to end on, like the story you need to tell. You know, I think both of you have had that experience. Both of you have felt that and have answered that call. And I loved what, how you both also nodded to the messiness of the journey and how um, you don't always know what you're doing. Um, a lot of the time, I feel like I'm just walking around in a dark room, like trying not to hurt myself. You know, <laughs> it's just like what <laughs> you do. You don't always know where you're going or what you're doing. Um, but also you both mentioned kind of being able to reach out, um, like Maggie, you had your sister in those times that you could come back to. And, um, so I, I know a lot of people, perhaps a lot of people here are MFA students or have attended an MFA program, or maybe you're writers or just artists or creatives in your own community. Um, but these connections, like these, um, friendships and relationships that you have, I think are also just so important to rely on and to help you get through that kind of, um, of maze. <laughs> so um, we just one more time wanted to thank all of you for being part of this community tonight, for being part of this journey tonight. Um, we want to wish you all the best with your own journeys. And I definitely recommend you read both of these books. Um, I've read them both and I've loved them. Um, so please check them out online and thank you one more time to UC Riverside Palm Desert for having us tonight. We are so lucky to be here and um, happy trails, <laughs> enjoy.